Hello everyone, I'm Tom Standage, Digital Editor of The Economist, and I'm your host for a discussion today about big data from data to insights. We'll be talking to a couple of experts on this subject from Microsoft shortly, but to set the scene, first I'm going to give a brief presentation about the business and societal benefits of big data. So, big data, we all hear a lot about it. What is it? There are lots of different definitions of it. One definition is technical. Big data is whatever won't fit into a conventional database. But that def definition isn't really working so well anymore because databases are getting better at coping with this. My favorite definition is this one. Big data is when the human cost of throwing away data exceeds the machine cost of storing it. This definition comes from George Dyson, who is a historian of technology and a great man. He's written a very good book called Turing's Cathedral, which I recommend very highly. And um, this definition is, I think, a great way of capturing what's going on with big data because essentially it has got to the point now where there's lots of data coming in. You worry that if you throw it away, you might be throwing away something valuable and it's really not very expensive to keep it. In fact, you can keep all of it for very little indeed. And so this gives you then this massive trove of data that you can potentially analyze. Um, that said, uh, why is it that all of this data is coming in? Where is it coming from? Well, it used to be the case that uh, big data was something that was limited to particularly large data intensive companies. That would be things like telcos, financial services companies, and of course, internet giants who have to deal with enormous amounts of data. Um, but there are things that are changing. There are lots and lots of new sources that are making big data available to a much wider range of companies. Here are some big numbers. You can see that the, uh, the amount of data being generated is, is rising very quickly. Um, choose a big number. Um, but where is this data coming from? It's coming from, well, the usual things like transactional data. It's also coming from supply chains. It's coming from CRM systems. Yes, it's coming from websites. Increasingly, companies are making products that are actually able to report data back. And uh, we're getting uh, machine-generated data from things like photocopiers, jet engines, uh, obviously smartphones and apps, even cars, construction equipment. This is producing lots more data. Then there's social media. There's an enormous amount of uh, information available. No matter what company you are, somebody will be discussing what you're doing, what they think of your products out there on social media. Or they'll be talking about the kind of product they would like, the kind of service they would like. Maybe they're unsatisfied with something else that they're using. So there's potential insights to be gained from looking at conversations that are going on on social media. Then there's the digitization of documents, things that used to be done on paper, um, things like medical records, people walking around with clipboards, more and more of that is becoming uh, available. And, uh, and then there's digitization of old documents in the form of photographs, uh, OCR, character recognition is getting much better. Uh, video analysis, massive amounts of video coming out of, uh, of cameras um, is much more susceptible to analysis than it used to be. And audio as well. So if you have uh, a call center, for example, and you have large amounts of audio being generated there, that can now actually be transcribed in mind and you can use that to look at the sentiment of customers. So there's an enormous amount of information here. My favorite examples are actually where people are generating data on their own, the quantified self idea where you wear a wristband or some sort of tracker. People are actually volunteering to generate data about themselves, share it with companies, very, very clever models from people like Nike where uh, because they can see how much I'm running, they can work out when my trainers might be wearing out and, uh, and offering me a, a new pair. Um, so the value lies in combining and analyzing all these different sources of data. And uh, the uh, saying goes uh, that the volume, the variety, and the velocity of data are all increasing. So you've got an enormous uh, range of new sources, and they're new sources of different kinds of data that are quite hard to get your head around and quite hard to, uh, uh, to correlate and to analyze. So you don't just need cheaper storage. This isn't the only thing that's going on here. This is also about cheaper and better processing power, better analytics, uh, better machine learning algorithms and that sort of thing. Uh, the upshot of all of this is that, um, here are some more big numbers, uh, you can see that the, uh, a, a, an enormous amount of the data that's being generated is unstructured, and that means that uh, it's not conventional, neat stuff in, uh, in spreadsheets or, or database tables. Um, the upshot of all of this is that uh, big data is no longer the province simply of telcos or internet giants or oil companies that have long had massive amounts of sensor data or medical companies that are you know, medical providers who may have a lot of uh, of scans or medical records, that sort of thing. Uh, instead, this is something that all companies really above a certain size uh, now need to start thinking about. There's a, a nice number from McKinsey, which is that the average US company with more than 1,000 employees uh, is now sitting on um, 
about 235 terabytes of data. And that's, uh, that's the Library of Congress, essentially. So this is you. Uh, this is the Library of Congress. They don't look like they're making particularly efficient use of the space in the Library of Congress there. I'm sure they could fit a bit more in. Um, but the point is that there is a Library of Congress worth of data in, in a typical medium-sized company now. Uh, and that means there's a huge opportunity here, because using data wisely can be uh, a way to make a company more productive, more profitable, more valuable. Um, and uh, there was a study in 2011 that found that uh, effective use of big data increases the productivity of a company by 5 or 6 percent on average, profitability even more. Um, Gartner reckons that firms that make canny use of big data will, uh, will grow 20 percent more than their peers. So you don't have to do this, but if you don't, your competitors will be and they'll have an edge. So you need to uh, start thinking about how you're going to do it. So what are the benefits of all of this? Well, the most obvious one um, is just making companies work more efficiently. If you've got greater visibility of what's going on, you can make your supply chain more efficient, you can forecast things. Um, so here's a nice example. This is Zara, um, a, a fashion brand, very, very efficient supply chain. They're able to respond to trends in the market very, very quickly by analyzing what people are actually buying in different stores. Uh, but they go further than that. They do things like they scan the, um, the items that people don't buy as they leave fitting rooms. So they can see what's being tried on and then actually not bought and respond to that. Uh, another example would be utilities. Utilities can, uh, with things like smart meters, have an awful lot more data they can crunch on now to, uh, to work out how to forecast demand and then not have uh, unnecessary power stations operating. Uh, they can also take into account other sources of data than their own. They can take in things like weather data. Uh, they can look at uh, you know, other factors and, and combine that to produce uh, better forecasts. Um, and uh, smart meters are a very interesting example because if you think about how often meters used to be read, um, these utilities utilities had a, a, a data coming in from their customers only you know, a few times a year, maybe twice a year, and now they can uh, take a reading every few hours. So this makes much more fine-grained forecasting possible, but only if you can process the enormous flood of data that you, you end up with. Um, another nice thing you can do, uh, for example, you can predict when machinery might fail. You can put sensors all over it, and uh, uh, then before a, uh, an airline engine needs servicing, you can actually uh, uh, preemptively maintain it. Um, the latest generation of aircraft actually produce terabytes of data on every uh, transatlantic flight. Uh, so there's an enormous potential to improve fuel efficiency uh, and other aspects of aircraft performance, but only if you can actually uh, get your arms around this data. Um, another example would be uh, that you can take all this sort of information and use it in product design to improve product design. So. Uh, Makers of electric cars are, for example, using data that's coming back from the uh, vehicles they've got out in the world now about how effectively the batteries are working, uh, you know, how the car's performance varies with, with temperature. They've got thousands of cars on the road, and they can, uh, they can crunch all of this data to improve the, uh, the performance of cars and, and make better cars in the future. So these are all examples of improvements to existing business processes made possible by big data. This is the kind of immediately obvious use of this. Uh, so the question is, what could your company do uh, to, to uh, make it itself more efficient and more productive by analyzing the data that it's sitting on. Um, so that's you know, one thing. But a nice thing about this is you can experiment. Now, when we think about experiments, we tend to think about this sort of thing. Here are some um, scientists in a lab doing an experiment. But big data allows companies to do experiments as well. Uh, a good example of this would be, uh, would be McDonald's. Um, they have been fitting equipment into some of their stores to measure. They're using a, a combination of video cameras, uh, and then they, they're using data from the tills as well. And they can combine all of this data, and they can use it to try out changes to the design of restaurants, to the menu selection, to training programs. And essentially, by introducing these changes in some stores, in some regions, uh, you can then compare the results that they get with stores in other regions, and then you can see uh, what the effect of these different things are. So this is the sort of thing that you couldn't do before, um, or at least you couldn't do as precisely. And you can now really see what the, uh, the fine-grained impact of a particular thing is. You may also be able to benefit from what economists call natural experiments. And this is where some change in the environment, maybe it's uh, you know, the impact of uh, a, a a change in the weather on uh, retail sales, or maybe it's uh, a change in regulation that affects a particular uh, part of the world, a particular market, and not another. But you can then crunch the data from those different markets and work out what effect that particular change has had and, uh, and how you might be able to benefit from it. So. Um, all of this ability to experiment uh, allows you to try out new things. I think the most famous example, the most obvious, would be A-B testing on websites. We're familiar with the idea that you can do split testing, try out things that are, that are more effective. Well, just imagine that applied more broadly in the, uh, uh, the broader business model of other companies, not just web firms. And uh, this is the kind of thing that, uh, that experimentation makes possible. So what sort of things could your firm do uh, with these kinds of experiments? How might it be able to take advantage of the ability to experiment? 
Another thing big data does is it makes possible new business models. Um, and these business models can be new business models within existing firms, but if existing firms don't do them, then startups will. Um, so the most obvious and mature examples are on the web, uh, new business models uh, for doing things like showing ads next to search results uh, or suggesting products based on your web browsing history or past purchases. These are business models that were not possible before all of this uh, data was available to, to, to crunch on. But it's not just for web companies. Um, there are other companies that may also find that the, the data exhaust that they generate is of value to us others. Um, so here uh, on this slide, I have the, the example of Signify. Signify is a startup that generates credit scores by crunching mobile phone usage data. So essentially, you take um, usage patterns from a telco, and you can then work out, actually, it turns out, by analyzing the, uh, the patterns of phone usage, comparing that with the credit scores of, of users for whom credit scores are known, you can work out uh, who are the customers of a given telco who would be a better uh, credit risk or who'd be a good person to uh, offer a new product to. Um, it sounds a bit creepy, but it means people People with no uh, credit record at all can actually access credit, which they previously couldn't have done. So um, this is a, a potentially very interesting and useful new business model. Um, similarly, mobile phone companies can provide information about traffic flow or transport patterns. Uh, logistics companies may find that they have data on economic activity that's valuable to other firms for forecasting. So um, this is a new business model that those companies wouldn't previously have thought of. If you're a telco, are you in the business of traffic forecasting? No. A recent twist on this is it turns out that you can actually use data from mobile phone phone networks to measure what's going on in the weather, because the microwave links between mobile phone base stations, uh, their effectiveness is, uh, is determined by how much water there is in the air. So you can actually look at a mobile phone network and, and see how the traffic is affected by how much rain there is. Now, this is not something that a, a mobile phone network may want to do, but there may be other people who are interested in that data. That is a new model for that telco. Um, other firms that are using big data analytics to unlock uh, new business models, uh, another example is Wonga. Um, in fact, there's a whole load of these companies. Wonga Zestcash, LendingStream, Klarna, Billfloat, Cabbage, OnDeck. Um, what they're doing is they're using a wider range of signals than would previously be used to do credit scoring again. So instead of just looking at somebody's you know, financial history, you actually look at things like social uh, signals from, from the web um, to assess risk. And uh, it turns out that um, Wonga, when they started off, had a 50% default rate um, on their loans. But because they were able to tune their algorithm successively and work out what was a reliable signal and what wasn't, um, with enough crunching and enough data, they were able to reduce their default rate to 7%. Um, and this means that, uh, you know, this is one of the sorts of things we could do with more of at the moment, more accurate means of assessing credit risk. Uh, we can't have too much of that. And then another nice example is clout. Um, it provides reputation scoring for social media users. You may be an obsessive clout user who checks your clout score every day. I certainly know people who are. Um, Influencers who then have a high cloud score are offered special perks from partner companies. This is a model that couldn't have existed before because essentially cloud is taking the data exhaust from social networks and crunching it to provide something useful. Um, some people think this is unfair. If you are asking your airline for an upgrade and they notice that you have a higher score than the other person who's asking for an upgrade and give you the upgrade because they think you're more likely to say nice things about them on, on Twitter or something like that, is that fair? We don't know. But this is the sort of question that's, uh, that's, being, uh, uh, that's emerging because of these new business models. But this isn't just about companies doing better. Um, as well as having this uh, more accurate forecasting, ability to experiment and new business models, there are actually broader benefits to society that can come from using big data. Um, where I live in, in Britain, the uh, National Health Service is about to embark on an extremely ambitious project to uh, sequence 100,000 genomes. The price of genome sequencing is probably going to fall below $1,000 per genome this year. Um, and so that means you can start to uh, sequence really large numbers of entire genomes and then look across all of them. Uh, you can compare uh, the, uh, the outcomes of treating different people and uh, the specific emphasis of this project under the NHS is going to be on cancer treatment because it turns out that uh, the old one-size-fits-all model for blockbuster drugs where everyone gets the same version of the drug and it either is deemed to work or doesn't no longer really uh, applies. It, it turns out that uh, particularly with cancer treatments, cancer treatments may only work in a subgroup of the population and you need to identify which subgroup that is and for a given uh, patient which uh, treatment will be most effective. So there's an amazing benefit that can come from just looking at this uh, incredibly wide range of uh, 
uh, of genomes from 100,000 different people, but it's a massive, massive uh, data processing problem. The uh, rate at which uh, genome sequencing is improving is much, much faster than Moore's law. In fact, it, it makes Moore's law positively tortoise-like. Um, and that means that actually the challenge here isn't so much uh, sequencing the data, it's, it's actually knowing what to do with those uh, sequences when you've got them. Um, this particular map here is a, is a map of, I think it's Rome, and it's, uh, it's using mobile phone data uh, to uh, look at traffic patterns within a city. Again, I, I mentioned this earlier on that the uh, telcos are able to sell this information uh, or make it available to other people who, who might be able to do these other non-telco things with it. But if you're a, a city and you want to work out where to put a, a new transit system or, or uh, you know, how, uh, how the weather affects uh, the way that people move through the city, that sort of thing, how to, how to do uh, uh, traffic planning, um, then uh, telco data is actually an extremely useful source of information. Uh, it gives you a, a, essentially a sensor on every person um, in the city and you can see how quickly they're moving and you don't actually have to be able to identify them individually to do this but uh, you can you can draw extremely wide and useful conclusions from being able to do this so big data from telecoms operators can be used to actually improve urban transport planning um, and uh, you can measure the behavior of tens of thousands of people see how it varies over the year uh, and in response to other factors um, so how can your company's data be be put to uh, the use of um, society as a whole. Maybe there's a way that your company's data uh, will actually have uh, you know, these, these wider societal benefits that, that just haven't occurred to you yet. And finally, and this is um, one of my favorite examples, um, taking an even broader view. Um, big data is allowing us to actually uh, look at the universe in, in new ways, um, from subatomic physics up to the structure of the universe itself. So the Higgs boson was discovered by analyzing the enormous amounts of data produced by the Large Hadron Collider uh, run by CERN. And um, that was essentially a big data problem. Uh, you have to kind of figure out from this torrent of data when these particles crash into each other, uh, which ones, uh, which particles they've turned into and whether there's a signal there that tells you that, the, that there's a Higgs boson. And it turns out that there is. Uh, but my favorite example actually comes from astronomy. So um, it's the slow Digital Sky Survey. It's been running since 2000. It's a robot telescope in New Mexico. Uh, it's something like a 120 megapixel camera. It's, it's huge. And it scans the sky every night and it produces 200 gig of data every night. So it's now produced hundreds of terabytes of data. Um, and it does this with different filters so you can see uh, uh, different aspects of you know, infrared emissions and, and that sort of thing. Um, and this has been used by astronomers for the basis of, uh, of hundreds of scientific papers now. And they've made new discoveries about asteroids, uh, brown dwarfs, galaxies formation, dark matter, the structure of the universe, the evolution of quasars, all that sort of thing. So this is really serious uh, data. It's extremely useful to astronomers. What's interesting about it is that it's also made freely available online and it's made available to amateur astronomers as well. And there's a, uh, this picture here is, uh, is of something called uh, Hanny's Vorwerp, which means Hanny's object. It was discovered in 2008 by a, uh, a school teacher in the Netherlands, and she was taking part in a, uh, an online project called Galaxy Zoo. And this is where human volunteers go through the galaxies that have been spotted by the, uh, the SDSS survey, and they categorize them, because having that metadata then allows astronomers to do statistical analyses of, uh, of different shapes of galaxies and to try and tease out the patterns of galaxy formation and galaxy structure. So she was one of these volunteers. She was looking at that galaxy you can see there on the right and she noticed this strange green thing to the left. Now this strange green thing to the left is about the size of our Milky Way. Um, it looks like it's the, uh, the sort of leftovers of, um, of, a, of a system that used to be a quasar. People aren't really quite sure but anyway there's, there's some connection to the evolution of quasars. Um, it's now named after her so she has something the size of the galaxy named after her. Um, and, uh, and this is the sort of thing that happens when you make uh, big data available uh, just out there so people can make their own discoveries. So um, I, again, bring, bringing this back to a company, if you make your data available um, to everyone within your company, you don't have to make it available to the public, although there are firms that do that as well. But if you just make the data you have within the, the walls of your company available to all of your employees, you may be surprised at, uh, at what they discover, uh, provided they have tools that make it easy for them to, to, to have a look. But what unexpected discoveries might be, might be lurking inside your company? So all of this, um, I think, is very exciting and, and opens up an enormous uh, range of opportunities and uh, ways in which business will be transformed in the coming years. Uh, that said, there are a number of obstacles to adopting this, and this is a, this is a McKinsey chart that looks at the extent to which uh, big data is easily adopted in different industries and the size of the opportunity. Now, this actually dates back to 2011 and uh, a number of people 
have said that this, uh, you know, underestimates the potential in, in some fields. But the basic idea is that uh, the opportunities vary from industry to industry, essentially because different industries find it easier to do this. They are better set up than others. Uh, and this is just one of the obstacles to adoption here. Uh, essentially, uh, embracing big data requires new technology, new skills, new cultural mindsets. It may actually require new management and corporate structures as well, because you need to link up these currently uh, disjointed silos of data across the company. Um, so technical, technical challenges, well, it's not always easy to integrate new things like this into existing processes, systems, and corporate structures. Um, if you do this as an IT project in the corner, then you won't reap the benefits. The whole point is that this has to encompass uh, all the data across the whole company and be available uh, to people throughout the company and be integrated into the processes that are going on. So this isn't just something you can start up as a skunk works thing on the side. Um, to, to get the benefits of big data, it needs to be uh, rolled into existing processes and, and integrated with existing systems and tools. Another problem is skills. Um, there really aren't enough people who know how to do all of this yet. Uh, being a data scientist is, uh, doesn't sound very sexy, but it's actually uh, one of the sexiest uh, things you can study at the moment because there's such demand for this. Um, a survey of uh, executives at an American utility, uh, sorry, across American utilities, for example, found that 71% um, of them said they were having trouble finding enough people who could cope with the influx of data they have from things like smart meters. And McKinsey reckons the US has a shortage coming up of about 190, 200,000 people uh, in this field by the year 20. So um, definitely something for, uh, for people to be moving into, retraining, um, learning at college. And uh, McKinsey also reckons that, uh, that U.S. companies will need another one and a half million managers and analysts who have some experience or, or understanding of this. They may not be actually crunching the data themselves, but they need to be uh, experienced with doing it. And that brings us to this whole question of culture. Um, this is partly a technical challenge, but it's also a cultural challenge. Instead of going with a hunch, you can now test, you can experiment, you can let the data speak. Many people will be happy with that, but many people won't. Um, for many years, expert systems have outperformed doctors in many diagnoses, but they're not used. Why is that? Because doctors don't like the idea of giving up their autonomy to a machine. And many managers now face a similar uh, dilemma that, uh, on the one hand, uh, there's potentially better results here, but on the other hand, they really don't want to give up their autonomy. They don't want to be bossed around by a machine. So so I think this is going to require a cultural change for, for people to be prepared to listen to the data. Um, and uh, instead, in fact, I think this could be used to resolve uh, disputes. If you have two people who are arguing about something, should we do A or should we do B? Well, let's let the data decide. Let's do an experiment. Let's try. So this, I think, could, could potentially resolve those sorts of disagreements. Um, but. That said, in order for this to work properly, you have to cut across organizational boundaries. And that may also be unpopular. Uh, what will your IT department think about this? What will people who manage particular databases that are stores of value within your company think about this? Do they really want to open up and share with other people? So um, and there's also this worry that people will be concerned that their judgment will be automated away. And then, of course, there's this broader question of, of privacy. Um, a famous example of Target, uh, which um, received unwelcome attention last year when it supposedly discovered that a teenager girl's shopping patterns revealed that she was pregnant um, and it mailed her baby related coupons before she'd actually told her, her family that the uh, that this was going on but with sensible safeguards I think the uh, the benefits of big data can, can easily out, outweigh the risk so we have to be mindful of these of these things but uh, uh, you know this is a this is a, the sort of concern that has arisen before and there seem to be ways of dealing with it so the upshot of all this is it's time to get started on big data. If you haven't done so already, you may be sitting on this library of Congress worth of data, potentially unlockable um, opportunities, insights are lurking in there, provided you can turn data into insights. So I wish you the best of luck in tapping the big opportunities that, that are presented by big data. And to discuss this more broadly, um, I'm now going to uh, introduce our two experts from Microsoft, and they are Dave Campbell, and he is a Microsoft Technical Fellow. His present role is Vice President of Product Development for the SQL Server Product Suite. And uh, he's worked on many other things at Microsoft, including uh, the initial product development of Azure uh, services and uh, defining and implementing SQL Server's global development processes. Uh, you also hold several patents in data management and uh, software quality. So welcome, Dave. And our other speaker is Raghu Ramakrishnan, and he's a technical fellow in the server and tools business at Microsoft. He focuses on big data and integration between uh, the server and tools business, cloud offerings, and online service sorry, online service divisions, platform assets, and he has more than 15 years of experience in database systems, data mining, search, cloud computing, that sort of thing. So let's talk about this. Um, Dave, let me start with you. Um, big opportunity then in big data. 
And uh, what's Microsoft's take on this? What does Microsoft bring to the table? Yeah, it's a great question, Tom. One of the things that's fascinating here is I've been in the database industry in one form or another for coming up on almost 25 years. And if you look back five to seven years ago, many people thought of it as a solved problem. Um, and what has really exploded uh, over the last five years is something you highlighted very well. And one of the things that's been interesting to be at Microsoft during that period is that we are one of a few or maybe the only company that is in some of the large internet services that you mentioned, Skype and Bing and Xbox and Xbox Live, and has a commercial uh, database business as well. And the learning that's going across that, how do we take tools and techniques, how do we meld both the learning and the data, uh, that's sort of the opportunity. And I'd couple that with the other thing that Microsoft has done traditionally is how do we take technologies uh, they're difficult to use and make it easier and more accessible, broadly available to a large number of people. So that's the approach. So uh, the, I suppose, exhibit A in all of this is your implementation of Hadoop, um, HD Insight. And um, the idea then is to, is, is, to, is to tackle these two problems, mm -hmm. uh, one of which this, this is perceived to be difficult to implement. Mm -hmm. So you want to, you want to address yes. that. And then you also want to be able to integrate this with the, with the tools people have. Yeah, it's a yeah, great point. So, with Hadoop and HD Insight, which is powered by Hadoop, uh, we're going to offer it both as a server, so people can install it and run it themselves, or uh, it's available in preview right now on our Azure uh, cloud platform. And the idea is to take the friction out of it, to be able to just have data that's available, to be able to just define and run jobs over it without having to manage and run the infrastructure, particularly on the server side. Uh, and then you highlighted a lot of examples of things that I broadly classify as information production. How do I take signals of one form and turn them into something of another form? Uh, and what we find in many of these scenarios is that once a transformation has been done from one domain into another, uh, it fits quite well in with the existing set of BI tools and things that, that we have. So, for example, taking GPS telemetry from an ambulance fleet and turning it into response times, then being able to analyze that uh, in existing tools like analysis services, or frankly, a lot of people just sitting in front of Excel. Uh, and making things easy for that. So we've done things like uh, Data Explorer, which is in preview. People can just get at data in HDFS, the Hadoop uh, file system, be able to integrate, search, find other forms of data, bring it together to develop their own insights. Um, and so that's, that's the thing. Take the friction out of both running and managing, uh, and take the friction out of developing the insights as well. Great. Now, Raghu, let me ask you about this. Um, what about this cultural shift that, that comes with, uh, with having to, having to uh, you know, even if you can solve all these technical problems, that's, that's not the whole story, is it? It's not. I think you touched on this, Tom. Uh, you made this point about people's resistance to letting an algorithm overrule them. Actually, I think it's a little more subtle than that. There's a very fundamental change where an organization has historically looked at their data as a means to an end, maybe for bookkeeping. That's changing. They now see that data as a core asset to be leveraged in a myriad ways. But how that happens, the change there is a lot more subtle. So as an example, if you think about the challenge of algorithmically selecting what to show someone when they visit your website, right? there's a lot of algorithmic show this happening, true, at some level. But there's also a great deal of human judgment involved. Okay. What is the underlying pool of assets you want your algorithms to choose from? What are the guardrails you want to establish by way of policy? Are you trying to maximize the number of return visits? Are you trying to maximize net return on investment over a window? These can greatly influence how the algorithms work. And what happens now is by freeing the humans in the loop from the mundane aspects of what they do, all of a sudden, they, they realize there are now new job descriptions that previously mm. they were unaware of that they need to fill. So this isn't the automation of all judgment. No. It means you can concentrate on these higher level judgments. It's a different sort yeah, of judgment. It is. It's very if, different. Yeah. If, I, if I might add one thing, you talked about the cultural change. And one of the folks, uh, as we've been in this dialogue with a lot of our customers, there's a class of people who own the enterprise data warehouse. Right. And they have the one version of the truth. Uh, and it was hard for those people to understand. And, and what I've come to say over the last few months, which resonates with this, that still remains an important and valuable version of the truth. No question. I said, but in this new world, there are multiple versions of the truth. There's a version of the truth of what people are saying about your products in the social sphere. 
There's a version of the truth that you can learn about from all of the digital exhausts coming off your operational process, everything just pure. And I said, if your competitors are paying attention to multiple versions of the truth, and you're only looking at one, are you keeping up? Exactly. And they're all, you can just see them be, become thoughtful in that, because they can see evidence of it yes. happening now. And another point to tag on to this, if you look at the tools that people need to do, do their job in this new world, it's not the case that there's this brand new class of tools called quote unquote big data tools, and that's all you need. Uh, you need conventional dashboards, which are monitoring the results of maybe very differently articulated decisions, right? Uh, what you need is something much more seamless, where you can blend and use the best of breed for every step of your overall task. And you know, this is going to require a fundamental shift in how people think about the kinds of platforms they need, the kinds of job functions they have, the mm. kinds of business processes they need to move towards, right? Uh, and even, I think, ultimately, where in their business's value chain mm. they derive the most monetization. Now, this is something that um, I touched on with this idea that if you're a telco, you might be sitting on data that's actually very valuable outside exactly. of your, your particular sphere. Exactly. Yeah. So if I'm, a, if I'm sitting on this data, how can I monetize that? It's been interesting because we've had a service available for several years known as the data market. Uh, and when we initially introduced it, uh, we received a fair bit of uptake from open government data and also for people who had content in data businesses. But at that point, we were just sort of seen, or the data market was seen as an alternate distribution channel. What's interesting now, and you cited a number of these examples, where a company can become a trusted aggregator of data in one form, do information production that transforms it in another, and they realize that they need to participate in a market and an ecosystem. Uh, and the data market is becoming an interesting place for a lot of new discussions with large companies on that front. So um, if I'm a large company and I'm sitting on this data, I can actually make that data available through the data market. And presumably I can also buy, if I'm a retailer and I want to buy weather data or something. Is that a, a sort exactly, of thing? Exactly. And so right. in, 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 as Raghu just mentioned, it's the ability to meld. And I, I refer to this as the return on accessible data. And accessible is the key word there because one of the things we want to do with the data market and data exploration tools uh, is we can actually use some of these techniques to help people find data. So people who have done analysis with these three data sets have also found value in these two. Would you like to incorporate them for your analysis? And so it's really fascinating how this is all building on top of itself. Where's um, machine learning's role in all of this? Because I know that's something that you've worked on in the past. Uh, and I appreciate your distinction between uh, different sorts of human judgment. But, uh, yes. but, but uh, surely there will be a greater role for algorithms to spot mm. these kinds of correlations in the future. Absolutely. I think there are an endless array of things you can do, right? Uh, Dave just gave you one example. Data discovery. It's an immense challenge, not just in the data market that Microsoft has, but in any given enterprise. As you pointed out, if you have a Library of Congress worth of data for a particular task at hand, what should you be looking at? You know, having a lot of data doesn't mean you necessarily are in a better position. Okay? So surfacing relevant information for you to look into, that's one. On a more operational level, uh, you know, here's an example from healthcare. When analyzing data about why a certain hospital had a somewhat unexpectedly high return rate for inpatients. They found that of all things, this had to do with a particular room's air conditioning being messed up. Mm. And so it was, it was causing more infection, mm. right? Discovering gotchas like this. Think about companies that have thousands of servers running. When something is likely to go wrong or has gone wrong, forensics, mm. right? Uh, as opposed to a human being manually coming up with conjectures and trying to drill down, you know, something's gone wrong. It's probably gone wrong before. And that means there's a pattern out there that an algorithm can discover for you, right? This is what machine learning can help with, to help you make the link mm. between certain things you care about and certain latent patterns in the data. The mathematics of this can be daunting, but the basic concept is not. And is correlation always causation? Because you may find a pattern in it. Is it real always? You talked about McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Well, ketchup, the amount of ketchup that's consumed and the amount of fries that are consumed, strongly correlated. But 
causation is a little more mm -hmm. subtle. If you believe that the amount of ketchup consumed is the cause mm -hmm. of the amount of fries consumed, you would recommend a strategy where you sell the ketchup and give away the fries, right. and you'd probably be out of a job. Mm. Okay? This distinction between causation and correlation can be subtle. And while all the data in front of you can help you do certain things, teasing apart causation mm. is often not in the data. In this example I gave you, if you have all the data about the consumption of ketchup and uh, fries, that doesn't necessarily allow you to recognize what any human being who's walking into a mm -hmm. McDonald's knows instinctively. It's the fries. Right, yeah. so we're, we're back at this idea that, um, that there's still a very important role for human judgment. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Think of it as an aid to human judgment. Yes. Yeah. And that's part of the strategy as well, is that yeah. it's the people at the edge, the people who have the domain knowledge, whether it's they're at the front office deciding who they're going to give the upgrade to, whether they're going to... And so exactly. getting these tools out to people at the edge and, and tools that they're familiar with is a big part of our strategy. Well, let me ask you, if I was, um, if I was setting up, uh, I don't know, I want to set up a cloud-based Hadoop mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. um, would I necessarily think that Microsoft would be the, the provider uh, that I would go to first? Wouldn't I be saying, well, hang on a minute, Amazon has a pretty good reputation for providing this sort of uh, uh, on-demand services. Uh, so what's your, uh, what's your story there? Yeah, I would go back, and I think both of you have touched on this briefly, this notion of where is the net new value? Where's the real value in this? And uh, as we look at it, I think of the, the data that's available as potential latent value. And then there's a set of infrastructure tools, that, and Hadoop is a great example of a lot of people investing in a sort of a common infrastructure. But the real value is what you can do with the data, how you can turn it into something more useful. So uh, our approach has been to adopt Hadoop, to make it available as a service, uh, and make it very, very easy to use. Now, to your question, a lot of people were scratching their heads when uh, Microsoft, you know, we announced that we were going to support Hadoop. We have our own big data environment that in many ways is more technically sophisticated. We still use in the online services business, but many people were going to choose Hadoop, and there will be exabytes of data in the Hadoop file system, HDFS, and so they're taking friction out of that and having us be able to operate very well with that. And the, and the thing is, we wanted to do a great job and have a Windows port of Hadoop, which no one had done the work of, and we wanted to use it as the basis for this HD Insight service. So yeah, so the it's idea there is it's, it's easier to adopt and to get going with than it would be if you did it all yourself and you were yeah. you know, configuring so the service. It's just and... available as a platform service. The other thing that's really important is the data itself that we'll have available. Uh, so I mentioned data market earlier. So if you think about how do I extract value from accessible data, uh, as we pool and have available more and more data there, it's just going to become a, a really rich environment. There's another point I want to make here. If you look at what it takes to derive value from this data you have, storing it is just a starting point. When you, when you consider the whole range of analytic processing that's involved in this information production life cycle that Dave talks about, there's a number of things where Microsoft has been there, done that. You know, uh, our BI tools are known for being simple to use, right? And given this McKinsey report and the huge dearth of trained people, tools that are easy to use are going to be at a premium. And when you look at the variety of tools that we already have, this is the point about the big data world not being completely disjoint from the traditional uh, data processing world. Where I think we have an edge over pretty much everyone out there is in the maturity and the range of end-to-end -end tools we have for analyzing a whole range of data at all stages of the life cycle. Mm. So it's a and spectrum of tools is the precise. idea. So that's yes, why you're it's it's highly You mentioned cloud. Okay. I just want to, so the, uh, I think it's the CEO or CTO, he has a blog post. It's a great blog yeah. post because they use analysis services at the tail end. So the information production out of the signal yeah. and then produce a large cube and then just run it there. And he has a blog post. It's kind of like a Microsoft, yes, Microsoft, here's why. Right. Uh, and so they're using it at, at that end. And those are tools that are familiar to a lot of people. Yep. So Right. So this is clout and, uh, and their decision to build their, uh, their big data solution on your, on your platform. Mm -hmm. um, let me, just going back to one more thing on this, that yes, it, it has raised eyebrows, um, this uh, Hadoop port. Mm -hmm. to Windows, mm -hmm. um, because this is exhibit A in Microsoft sort of getting religion about open source. Um, mm -hmm. This is a cultural shift within Microsoft as well, isn't it? It is, it is. But it's a, it's a natural course for us. And 
I was with others sort of looking at this several years ago, somewhat instrumental in our decision to go with Hadoop for this purpose. But the market, frankly, uh, had already voted. Uh, and the question is, what can we bring uniquely? Uh, and where can we stand and share with others in a way that we all benefit uh, and then be able to bring our own unique contribution on top of it? So uh, it's something that's a bit of an evolution both in terms of the market and uh, within the company, yes. Yeah. To add a different perspective to this, I came to Microsoft about a year ago from Yahoo, mm. where we were involved in the development of Hadoop, among other things. My team is very involved, even today, in contributing to Hadoop and other parts of the open source universe. One of the reasons I came here, we came here, was this transformation inside of Microsoft, and uh, it's very real, mm. right? It's tied also to, I think, a fundamental commitment to services, right? And open source and services sit together very comfortably. So. And also this idea that um, everything, uh, we see this time and time again in uh, technology battles, A versus B, you know, which will win? Mm. And the answer is usually neither. Mm. It's usually That's that right. there's a coexistence of many, many systems exactly. overlapping and, and different approaches. So we're, we're seeing yes. that here. Um, we're going to go to Q&A in a minute. But before we do, I just wanted to ask each of you to sort of sum up. Mm -hmm. uh, for people who are um, thinking about uh, getting started here, mm. uh, what's, your, what's your advice to them? And, and, uh, and having, having uh, been in this field for a long time, you know, uh, what, what do you wish uh, mm. you'd known when you, uh, when you first came into it that you would like to pass on to people who were just getting started now? Sure. I think the thing I'd use there is a perspective of we do executive briefings, and I've spent the last two or three years talking to Fortune 500 companies around the globe. In fact, I have one right after this. Um, the dialogue has evolved tremendously in the last two years from a curiosity, I would say, 24, 30 months ago, to I need to get started. How do I get started? And uh, I'll have questions. Well, what do you mean, capture all data? How do you define all? How do? And my advice to people is to just get started, uh, because y I find that you'll quickly tune your intuitions um, and uh, just get in. And the thing I would also say is that it is very much additive. So the existing tools that you have um, still remain valuable, particularly when you can do information production in a very easy form that you know can bring data of, of a new variety into those tools. So again, you know, to net it out, it would be get started. Uh, the public preview of HD Insight on Azure, you can sign up for that. Um, uh, there's a Microsoft.com slash Big Data URL that has a lot of the tools and a lot of case studies and such. And so. Uh, just jump in. And uh, is your uh, advice that you should sort of assemble a cross a company team that so that this doesn't end up being siloed in a particular bit of the of the company? Is that is it important to sort of have it be uh, cutting across existing corporate structures from the off? I think a lot of it depends on where your culture is, right? And certainly, the, uh, what I've seen a lot over the last several years is uh, a technology incubation, sort of sponsored by the CTO's office, to. Several months ago, we met with an entire large division of a Fortune 10 company who said that this division is going to be the vanguard in big data and brought in a whole host of people to educate. So I think it depends on where you start from. But it's just to me, it's simply a matter of getting started. OK. Raghu, what's your advice to people getting started? Don't ask, why save this data? Ask, why not? Hmm. Right. That brings us and back to George Dyson. And yeah, exactly, yes. exactly. Yeah. And the next question you should be asking yourself is, in what ways can this differentiate me from my competitors strategically? Mm -hmm. Because take companies like Twitter and Facebook, for example. They're all about their data. That business model is all about unique data that they have in terms of their underlying information about the social interactions. What is your edge in terms of data? Mm -hmm. Right. And if you approach it from this way, I think you're thinking right. So uh, going back to the example of the telcos having this data that's um, precise. Yes. I mean, they, the canonical example in that's telcos. That's a lovely example. Well, they exactly because they've been using big data for many years to yes. to spot um, customers who are likely to defect. Mm -hmm. So they actually analyze yes. the social networks yes. within you know. And if my yes. the four people I call are all on a different network, they're worried I'm going to defect. And yes. so that's a kind of old school version mm -hmm. of. I mean, you know, they've been doing this yeah. for a decade. Um, but the new version of this is actually it turns out that data has other uses yes. as well. Right. So do you have do you have a, I mean, I've been banging on about. Okay. Do you have a favorite example of a sort of unexpected way in which you can discover data in, in uh, evaluating data? Actually, Dave has this great example of the trucking company. Oh, yeah, there's the, the one, actually, uh, Cabbage, 
is interesting. This one's right. public. Uh, Cabbage is a company that does uh, financing for small businesses. Right. Um, they've done a deal with UPS where they take, UPS will take shipping history for small businesses and turn it into a score. Right. And now it's interesting because UPS uh, is not just releasing the shipping history. They're doing information production to turn it into a score. Uh, so they're acting as a trusted aggregator. And then you can uh, release that score to Cabbage. You'll use it as a measure uh, for assessing risk. But this is a completely new use exactly. of data. Right. So UPS that, is, is turning into a credit scoring agency. Now, what about the, something we didn't touch on? Is actually so. Perhaps we should squeeze this in. It's just this question of privacy. Is that yeah. uh, is that a legitimate concern, and how can it be addressed? It certainly is. I'll, I'll let Gregor go in here for a second, but I think I separate it into two things. Uh, first off, many of the scenarios that I see uh, don't include privacy concerns. I think a lot of what's written about uh, starts there in sort of the personal social front, and I'll come to that in just a second. You mentioned uh, monitoring things from airline engines to make sure we do preventative maintenance uh, to keep the planes. We do the same thing here with our services that we'll look for servers that are going to fail and, and try to predict when they'll fail before they do. And, and so there's a tremendous amount of value that doesn't get into uh, the privacy. I think that the thing that will ultimately resolve it on the social privacy piece is a more transparent value exchange. And technologies come along and disrupted sort of the social contract for centuries. If you think about the introduction of the printing press and being able to write something about somebody and then just post it everywhere. Uh, and so it, it is just a matter of that. And that's something that on our services side, our internet services side, Bing and, and whatnot, there's a tremendous uh, sort of uh, push within Microsoft uh, to do that, to have people be in control of their own personal data. So I know what I'm disclosing, and I know what I'm getting back in, in value. So as long as, as long as it's a transparent exchange of value, I'm getting this in return for giving you this data. Yeah, I think that's, that's the ultimately point. the way what, that... Well. What's your take on the whole privacy question, Raghu? The bottom line is, I think it's crucial. I think if we are not mindful of privacy and a related issue of security, right, the whole thing could implode, mm -hmm. right? On the other hand, privacy is already an existing issue. And people are fundamentally okay with it if you only stop to think about it. When your credit card is put on hold because you were traveling abroad, you know the value you're getting in exchange for the inconvenience and for having someone look over your shoulder at your credit card usage. So it reminds you that this is going on all the time. Precisely. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. I think the key is transparency. And I'd add one other thing, choice. Mm -hmm. You know, if you say, look, We'll look at your activity, show you ads in exchange for a free service, and if that bothers you, for 25 bucks a year, you can have the service for free. Right. Once you put it out on the table, once you're clear in articulating what you do and give people choices, life is good. Yeah, I would like to. Um, uh, I would like the opportunity to pay uh, some of the online services that I currently use mm. free uh, yes. to pay for an ad-free service. To pay for, I would certainly pay for. Uh, for higher resolution um, uh, images on, on Facebook. Uh, mm -hmm. I would pay Twitter for, for better mm -hmm. analytics. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that would make them less dependent, in fact, on, um, on yes. selling my data mm -hmm. to other people. So, yes. so I would like to see uh, fewer free services, weirdly, but I may be in a, mm -hmm. in a minority there. Brilliant. Well, anyway, we have some, uh, some questions. Um, the first question is, uh, I'm going to direct this one to Dave. Uh, what is Microsoft doing to help customers take advantage of external data? Yeah, I talked briefly about uh, the data market. And uh, we have a tool we call Data Explorer that we just uh, announced an update to several weeks ago, and that's available. And the idea there is that within a corporation, we find that uh, there's just a graph of data flowing between systems that it's, it's almost the dark matter within. Uh, systems are built out of it, but people don't really know. So the idea is, can we elevate that? So what are the IT sanctioned feeds that are known to be clean and such, and how can people find them and bring them together? So uh, that's, you know, it, it can be external data, something we've purchased from others. It could be internal data that we've done our own sort this of system. This is like x-raying the company and figuring out where the sort of arteries of, of data exactly, are. And exactly. And the version of it that I've heard is, you know, no one knows what this server does. Let's unplug it and see who squeals. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a, a more yeah. subtle version of doing yeah. that because you can actually see how it's plumbed in. Yeah, and, we, and what we've done is actually constructed in the same way that web search has done a graph graph uh, and then be able to do more reasoning on top of that graph to create more value. Figuring out which system is connected to which and which is transferring data to others. So. Right. Okay. Um, another question is, how does all this get back to Microsoft services? Um, and it says services and components of data. I'm not quite sure what that question is uh, referring to. but. Yeah, yeah, I think I'll start and I'll let Raghu sort of bring his services experience into this is that um, 
We've had a number of people inside Microsoft, and many of them came from the server business. In fact, there's a technical fellow who uh, built the Bing search architecture uh, and their big data environment who used to work with me in the database space 10 or 11 years ago. And so uh, our experience up until recently where we would just kind of wave at each other from afar, now this coming together and uh, we're building SQL Azure as a service first built upon the technology. And so this cloud design point, the ability to learn across both of these and to take friction out of it for our customers. Um, some things will be done on premises for a long, long time. Some things will be done as services. Being able to bring large volumes of data together and bring uh, you know, data from my business up into a large computational environment in Azure to create uh, new value that then I can use in my business is a really interesting hybrid scenario. So this is part of that, the spectrum that you can go from a local database up into services and, yes. and you, you sort of play across that whole spectrum. And I think you know, Regu came more from the services side and saw that opportunity yeah. within. So. so first, let me echo what you said, right? There's going to be this continuum in terms of how people use the cloud and what they keep on-prem for a variety of reasons. But beyond that, let me make an observation. If you go look at pretty much any web service, it's data-driven. You look at a web page, the articles you see there, the ads you see there, right? The products you see recommended to you. There's a data-driven process behind each and every one of those things. Everything that happens, if a machine goes down, if a user visits a site, this is captured and is grist for the data-driven analysis that follows, okay? Uh, actions are data-driven. Business processes are data-driven. Let's cut to the enterprise now. There are very, very few enterprise applications that have this mindset of mm. being data-driven. Historically, these have been shrink-wrapped products without this notion of observability built in and without this notion of being data-driven baked in. I think we are at a watershed mm. in how enterprises are shifting, right? And as this shift happens, the premium on observing and then turning those observations to good use uh, is going to change the landscape of IT, and it's going to change the pace at which you're going to have to leverage elastic compute clusters, typically in so a in, public cloud. In, in theory, it can make you more agile, but you have to be set up in a way to you respond. To yeah, and the thing I'll just tack on to that is that the types of data available within businesses and the, the types of things that Microsoft are involved in. So there's a lot of talk about the social graph, right? Yes. Uh, within an organization that has Active Directory employed, that is the authoritative Precisely. graph of all the employees and their relationships and such. And you think about the email that flows through, if you think about what's being discussed in Yammer, what's being on SharePoint, there's a tremendous amount of signals that are within an organization uh, in which we can provide and drive and provide a whole host of new value. For them. Whereas if you impose a, um, a social uh, you know, internal enterprise social media system from above, you have to reconstruct that social graph from scratch. Yes, so, yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, I worked on both the internet side of things and now I'm looking at the enterprise side of things and frankly, the opportunity on the enterprise side is staggering, right? And it's largely untapped. Hmm. Well, that's probably a good place to, uh, to end our discussion. So thank you very much indeed, Dave, Dave Campbell and Raghu Ramakrishnan. And uh, there'll be an on-demand version of this video if you'd uh, like to see it again or uh, you came in part of the way through. Um, but that's all from all of us, and we wish you the best of luck in turning data into insights.